It was the first Hong Kong USA co-production. It has grossed over $200 million. It introduced the world to the most dynamic action star of this century. It is Enter the Dragon. Dragon, I decided to do it because I thought it was going to be a success. I thought that the climate had uh, come around to uh, that enough people would catch on and, and enjoy it. I, I thought it would be a success, and that's one of the reasons why I did it. But I didn't think, I didn't have any clue that it would be as much of a success. That, for example, 25 years later, there's uh, talk of uh, a re release theatrically of the film. I was speechless at the success of the film. I remember I was out of town and came back uh, uh, about 8 o'clock at night, and I lived in Hollywood, and we drove past the Grumman's Chinese Theater. And it was about 7 o'clock, and there was a line for Enter the Dragon. And, um, and I, I, uh, I was with someone, and we stopped the car, and I just got out in front of the theater, and but I realized the line wasn't for the show in half an hour. The line was for the show in two and a half hours. And I didn't believe people. I actually walked down the line and asked a couple of people, are you really <laughs> standing in line for a film two and a half hours from now? Um, so uh, I was flabbergasted, and I still am today. Before Enter the Dragon, Bruce's earlier films had broken all box office records. This enormous Asian market success did not escape the attention of Hollywood, and it was while Bruce was working on The Game of Death that he was offered the lead in a film titled Blood and Steel. The result is the first Hollywood Hong Kong co-production, to be later renamed Enter the Dragon. The picture, it's, it had a very interesting life. It was the first co-production ever done between a Hong Kong film company and an American studio. There had been a number of pictures that had filmed on location in Hong Kong going all the way back to the 50s, you know. Um, but nobody had ever actually tried to do a co-production. And nobody was quite sure what a co-production meant in Hong Kong terms. We had a Chinese film industry where most people spoke Cantonese or Mandarin. And they made films that were very stylized. So we were all feeling our way as we set up the mechanism for that co-production. Uh, it actually turned out quite well, although it was a little bit flying by the seat of our pants as we went. We were making the rules up. Um, we started on the project in October, preparing. We started shooting in January, and we finished shooting in March. The picture was completed in post-production by the end of June and was released at the end of August. So that was 10 months door to door. The film presents many challenges for director Bob Klaus. Well, Bob, um, I think Bob was a very talented director and uh, a very talented writer. I think he really understood story and he had a very good visual sense. He was a photographer himself. Uh, he really understood composition and how to tell a story with pictures. Uh, I think he was um, very good at that. So our communication was um, very easy. He uh, um, was very good at setting up shots. Um, 
he had a lot of challenges, particularly with language, and I think he had uh, many more challenges than I did because the, the type of scenes that he wanted to set up, uh, they weren't used to doing that. They weren't used to handling extras like that. They weren't used to the continuity of extras. Uh, usually the extras that we had one day would not come back the next day. There'd be a whole new group. So you had to shoot certain little bits of the film. And I remember actually uh, pleading with people, please, would you come back tomorrow? And we never saw them again. On the set, there were language problems. There were, you know, half a dozen people who spoke English and the rest spoke Cantonese. So everything took longer because it went through periods of translation, often coming back mistaken. Uh, things were built that weren't built the way they were to what they were supposed to be. Uh, that procedure went on. It was slow. Um, I was fed up with the whole business of doing martial arts fights after uh, the, the last big scene, which took a week or eight days to film. I thought, enough of this. I don't want to ever do this martial art fight stuff again in my life. The first days of shooting were really amazing because, you know, Bruce wouldn't come out. I mean, Bruce did everything to avoid starting. The very first scene we shot is the scene where he, he's in his room and Anna Capri parades in all these girls for him to pick a girl because we figured it took the easiest scene, he didn't have to move. And he was physically, he was a wreck. I mean, he was, if you look at the scene carefully, I mean, you can see his, his mouth is trembling. I mean, he was just so anxious and nervous. Not that he wasn't good, but he was, he, it was important for him. This was his first starring English language. I mean, this is, you know, everything that he was hoping for it to be. The problems fell in the categories of, number one, Hollywood has a certain preconceived notion about what Hong Kong is like and what Chinese people are like, and so the script had a few of those stereotypes in there. Uh, Bruce Lee was very conscious of not wanting to play stereotypical Chinese. He believed that he was, his, one of his goals in life was to be truly an international action star that also happened to be Chinese. The second half of the problem, or the second portion of problems, we had a Chinese film industry that had its own way of doing things. They didn't shoot sync sound, for example. So we had to instill discipline in the Chinese crew to work to the American style of doing things because the Americans were having a nervous breakdown at the idea of working Hong Kong style. Third set of problems was communications problems. We had very few bilingual people in the Chinese film industry in Hong Kong in those days. And I can assure you there was nobody in the American film industry that was bilingual in Cantonese. Uh, but by and large, it was a trouble-free production. Uh, with the hindsight of some 30 movies, we had less trouble on that as a co-production than you have on most movies that we shoot in Hollywood where everybody speaks English. There was a, there was a boat scene uh, on a junk heading out of Aberdeen Harbour. Um, and one of the, one of the uh, things that this particular scene called for was for me to jump out of the jump off the deck of the, uh, fully clothed, but off the deck of the junk and into this little dinghy. Uh, the first time I tried it, I had boots on and I went straight through the bottom of the dinghy. Uh, so they did a about turn and went back to Aberdeen, got a much bigger dinghy. Um, the next time they, 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 I was successful, got into the dinghy and they paid out the rope. Um, but I was being towed behind the, the junk at the end of a, a long rope. And this uh, chap on the bullhorn on the back of the junk was saying, pull on the rope, pull on the rope, get mad. So I'm shaking my fist and pulling on the rope at the same time as the bow of the dinghy was disappearing under the waves. So, so uh, the net result is I was left there bobbing and weaving in the, in the swell. And those junks don't turn around very quick. So I was, uh, went out of sight and it was a good five minutes before it picked me up. Bruce is a very complex human being. Um, first of all, there was no pretense about Bruce Lee. He was very much aware of who he was, what his roots were, what his background was. He was very proud of being Chinese. He was very proud of his martial arts. He was a perfectionist when it came to what he did, both in terms of martial arts and in front of the camera. Well, Bruce, one of the things that Bruce uh, wanted in the 
then the clips was as, as much realism as he possibly could, as we could muster. Um, so when Jim said, uh, you know, when we were ready to go, he said, uh, um, I'll just give it a bit of a tap, and I said, no, give me your best shot. So, so he did, and I went down in a heap, and, and uh, I thought that was the end of it. But then the cameraman said, well, now we'll take another take from the opposite corner and so forth, and there were six takes in total. Each time I got six of his best shots, so I was a little sore that night. Bruce Lee's drive for perfection did not just extend to the fight sequences. He saw this film as a perfect vehicle for presenting an accurate view on the philosophy of martial arts. A good martial artist does not become tense but ready. Not thinking, yet not dreaming. Ready for whatever may come. When the opponent expands, I contract. And when he contracts, I expand. And when there is an opportunity, I do not hit. It hits all by itself. Bruce Lee was actually responding to a frustration that he felt and had shared with us that writers in Hollywood were writing a lot of, if you will, techno babble about the martial arts that had very little to do with the real world of martial arts or the spirituality of martial arts or what the philosophy that goes hand in hand with learning martial arts. It is like a finger pointing away to the moon. Don't concentrate on the finger or you will miss all that heavenly glory. And Bruce felt that as part of what we could accomplish with Enter the Dragon, part of it was to showcase his martial arts skills, but part of it was also to try and educate the public as to what martial arts was really all about. And so he asked that in those scenes where martial arts was being discussed, that we at least try and put it in a proper context. Boards don't hit back. So anyway, that, there was this kid and said, I'll, I'll bet you anything I'm faster than you are. Bruce says, okay, if you're betting me, let me, let me, Help you out. Just draw a circle on the ground. Oh, yeah, I didn't remember. Remember, yeah, yeah, draw yeah, a circle yeah. on the ground. Yeah. He says, I'm going to let you hit me three times. Yeah. If you push me out of the ring, I lose. But I'm going to hit you back one time. So the kid did, right? Yeah. Of course, he never pushed uh, Bruce out of the ring. And then Bruce says, Okay, my turn. So I tell the kid, He said, I am going to hit you right here. Mm -hmm. He said, yeah. ready? And the guy, the kid says, what do you mean ready? Before he said anything, his teeth stopped falling out of the mouth. It was just so fast. I know that when you speak to the younger film directors in Hong Kong today, they all grew up on the Bruce Lee films. Bruce Lee is to them still an idol. When you talk about what would you like to do, the answer is I would like to make a film that could have as great an impact on the next generation as Enter the Dragon had on my generation. And I've been told that by not one Chinese director, by at least five or six. And actors, by the way. You ask Jackie Chan who the biggest star in Jackie Chan's mind is, and he will say without a doubt, Bruce Lee. In the early days of his career, Jackie Chan worked as a stuntman on Enter the Dragon. Here, he can be seen on the receiving end of Bruce Lee's considerable skills. One shot, who was doing the, doing the two stick. Just fighting. I was the last one. I was the last one. But he missed. He right here. Just one, well, one stick, and hit my right here. Then I, I do nothing. I just doing the normal things. A reaction, fall down. Then he also very good. You know, he doesn't say a lot of people when you hurt. Ah, oh, sorry. No, he just continue. Until the director said, cut, cut, you know. He said that he liked the Chinese uh, lunchbox with a lot of barbecue porks and, 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 and goose. And, and he said to me he purposely ordered double portion or triple portion because he felt the crew's lunch was not sufficient. And he will share all this 
meat or, or, or extra uh, 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 pork with the rest of the crew. When it came to dealing with the staff and, and dealing with the crew on the film or dealing with the office staff at Golden Harvest, he couldn't have been nicer. Uh, he was a very genuine, very sincere person. Something that he would do with a couple of people on the set uh, that he did with me once was uh, just to show you how fast he was, he would say, uh, he'd say, catch my hand, I'm going to touch your nose twice. And of course you're ready and your hand's ready and you're going to get him, of course. And I think he said, I'll give you ten bucks or something. And uh, you have your hand there and all of a sudden it's over. And he would have touched literally the, almost the hair on your nose, just within a hundredth of an inch or something. Bum -bum. Bruce was a very, very fit person, uh, uh, apart from his normal training regime, you know, as, as uh, one of the things that impressed me enormously were just simple things like uh, he sitting in a, a jackknife position on the floor um, with arms folded and feet up in the air. Anyone who tries that for longer than 10 seconds, that's a tough ask. He used to do it for anything up to half an hour or more, just watching TV. Pound for pound, I, I think I've said it before that he's, a, he's a, probably the strongest man I've ever met. So uh, w when he did Enter the Dragon, he has many, many a time called in for the discussion of the script. So in a, in a certain way, he contributed as much as anybody that, that was supposed to be involved because he wants the, the, I think it's the first time he showed the equal, equality of East and West that you can work together as one team, regardless of color of, of skin. I think for me it's, a, it's just a sort of wonderful vulnerability. And as we got towards the end of the film, the excitement, I mean, you know, we knew that we had something. And I knew Bruce was thrilled with it. And when we had it all together and Bruce came over and, you know, it, you know he just, it, it, the joy of seeing this guy having realized the life, you know, his life's dream. Sometimes, once sometimes I'd kid him, you know, because he was so um, ambitious in, in some ways. I said, gee, Bruce, what, what would you give to be 6'2 and 195 pounds? He said, if I were 6'2 and 195 pounds, I'd rule the world. 